In the uh, final uh, uh, lecture on the uh, self under siege, we will discuss the, uh, the work of Jean Baudrillard, a uh, French social theorist. Uh, actually, that now is a misnomer since one of Baudrillard's thesis, theses is the disappearance of the social. Baudrillard is perhaps the most important uh, theorist that can be characterized as postmodern. And, I, and uh, I have spent a lot of, uh, of time, in fact, in a previous uh, lecture series discussing the postmodern. I'm going to give a very brief characterization of it and then discuss uh, 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 Baudrillard's relationship to it. The self under siege in modernity has uh, always presumed that there was a self to be under siege. But in the view of Baudrillard, society has reached a point at which it has literally been overcome by its technology and the new and important issues aren't about uh, things like the non-believer or the non-offender, uh, uh, but about the non-person. In the world of Baudrillard, social relations have disappeared between humans because humans have begun to disappear. In fact, Baudrillard thinks that reality itself is in the process of disappearing, the real, what has been l learned and understood under the name of the real. All these outrageous things I've just said are worked out in a brilliant series of, uh, of books which draw a lot of their power from many of the phenomena we see around us. So one way to discuss Baudrillard is to run through some of these phenomena. What Baudrillard is doing is basically to trace the symptoms and tendencies of the trajectory of the postmodern. If we were really in a postmodern society, we wouldn't still be discussing things like the self under siege or the real. They would simply have disappeared. There we would be, in a way, transparently communicating one with another, as in an earlier example when I talked about the stock market crashing due to the computer rationality. Well, if we had really reached the postmodern in its fullest sense, the way Baudrillard uses it, it would be the computers unplugging us and not the reverse. The postmodern is a blurring of the lines between human beings and machines, a blurring of the line between reality and image. It is uh, a society, or I can't even really use that word anymore. It is a world, if you will, a, gr uh, a grouping of the world in which reality is simply that which can be simulated, Xeroxed, copied. That is a, a, one of his first theses. It's, in a, it's a book called Simulations. It's a very interesting thesis. Baudrillard argues that this process is that one of the central things is the way in which we, that, that, that's changed us fundamentally and has helped to bring our relations as humans to a close. I mean, in a way, Baudrillard sees himself as a post-apocalyptic writer. For Baudrillard, the apocalypse has already occurred. It wasn't religious or anything. It was not atomic bombs. At some point in the development of technology, human beings ceased to be the reason of things, and things took on their own reasons, technological things. Let me describe this, this uh, concept of simulation just a little bit, though. Baudrillard's definition of the real itself is that which can be simulated, Xeroxed, and copied. So whether you're talking about a human body where you can make a holograph of it, or you're talking about the Bible, which you can Xerox, or whether you're talking about uh, the sexual act, which can be simulated either through you know, repetitive porn pornographic films are in a very near future. It will be able to be uh, simulated with virtual reality where you'll wear a full body suit and uh, make love to your ego ideal, thus making it pointless to, uh, to search out all the Freudian implications. You can just pick your ego ideal, punch it into the laser beam program, slip into the virtual reality suit, thus rendering that relation, even that intimate relation, sexual relation, technological, simulatable, reproducible, 
to infinity. Now, all this sounds wild, crazy, and I don't want it to sound wild and crazy. I want it to sound the way that I think that it, it really should sound. And that's as though we could place ourselves, and I've used this analogy before, but I will again, as though we could place in our, ourselves in that era right before the atomic energy and television, before we knew all the myriad changes that they would make in the way that we were and the way we interact and so on. Well, we're in a, we're in a period now where I've already mentioned, and these are the phenomena that Baudrillard examines with the most care. In incredible information overloads with information moving at incredible speed. And even to the youngest children, I talked about how children used to learn morality from their parents, and now I think that Super Mario Brothers, th they spend much more time with Super Mario Brothers and are much more uh, like emotionally involved with Nintendo than they are with their aunts, their uncles, their mothers, and their fathers. I asked one of my children, why are you yelling at a machine when he began to bang his Nintendo. And he looked at me as though I were a being from another world. And because of that, there is a postmodern trajectory. I am from another world. I'm still, as it were, caught in the modern. He's not. Why not be emotional with a machine? His peers are machine-like. We've already discussed that. I mean, in fact, what he sees on the Nintendo screen is his thrill of the day. That's the most active he's seen any simulated image that day. <clears throat> now, simulation, this society didn't just come from nowhere, the society of simulations and of spectacles. Baudrillard actually builds his work on a foundation, again, that comes out of the Marxist tradition. Gay Debord wrote a book in the 60s called The Society of the Spectacle. And what it was about was about how when capitalism reached a certain level of accumulation, commodities began to detach themselves and become images. And citizens who formerly had played roles as political actors began to detach themselves from their own lives and become spectators. So, it, for example, you could, you could say, well, instead of like going to a family reunion now, we'll just rent, you know, a Steve Martin Father of the Bride movie. It's just as good and so on, and, and you meet the same kooky characters that you actually know. Their behavior is all simulatable. Uh, another, another similar, and this is going to sound cynical, but I don't want it to. I mean, uh, uh, Baudrillard has visited our country, and when he went to uh, Disneyland and Epcot Center and these various uh, parks, he said, well, this is much better than Europe. The food's better than Europe. It's a short walk between France and Germany land. Uh, you know, you don't have to go through all those, deal with all those nasty waiters. Everyone's so polite. The simulation has outrun the so-called reality. That concept in Baudrillard he calls the hyperreal. Hyperreality is more real than real. This is ad it actually sounds, if some of this sounds like advertising slogans, good. Because in Baudrillard, the, the heritage of philosophy and social theory has passed over into advertising and television. So if it sounds superficial, good. Because the theory, the world that he looks at has become superficial and banal. If it sounds hokey like a salesman's pitch, good. The world he describes is the world of Jurassic Park, not of Dante. So that is all evidence on the side of Baudrillard if you follow the argument deep enough and with enough clarity. Okay, let me explain the hyper-reality. This is an important concept in Baudrillard. In Baudrillard, uh, we've already said reality is simply that which can be simulated. Can't be simulated, not real. But more real than real is a reality, uh, and I guess I could, I could give you, again, I, I hate to use these movie examples if you haven't seen the movies, but in A Clockwork Orange, there's a great line that anticipates the postmodern when uh, when the, e the uh, character played by Malcolm McDowell says, it's funny how blood isn't really blood until you vide it on the screen, until you see it on a movie screen. In real life, it looks kind of brown and 
mucky on the screen. It looks you know, like more real than real blood. And this sense of the sort of hyper-reality we get with cinema, we get with television and so on, is another phenomenon Baudrillard wants to examine. And I think that here we get, and, and I mean, I guess my politics are showing again, but here we get the phenomenon of Reagan, the hyper-real president, more real than real. I mean, he's better at being Harry Truman than Harry Truman. I mean, the distinction about what he is is lost in the hyper-reality of his smile, which, like the Cheshire cats, you know, just gleams across his face. And we get for the first time a phenomenon never known in polling, which is the phenomenon of not liking a person, but of liking liking a person. This is a sign you're dealing with the hyper-real. Let, let me go over that again. Reagan's popularity was popular. When, we, when you went through the various traits of Reagan and what Reagan stood for and his policies and so on, uh, vast numbers of people disliked nearly all of them. What was popular was his popularity. So, and I don't think that Reagan's alone in this. Show business figures have this same thing go on for years. I can't remember the last Michael Jackson uh, song that I even listened to. And, or, or my kids, who also don't like Michael Jackson. But he's popular, but not, not in the old sense. It is a hyper-popularity, if you follow me. His, it is popular that he's popular. Madonna has learned to live and create herself on the curve of the postmodern by making it her goal to be more popular than popular, by having her popularity the topic of popularity. I mean, we found out that she can't particularly act or sing. She is not built well enough to, to, to be a, a true cybernetic sex symbol for this period. And yet she manages, because of her understanding of this situation that, I, that Baudrillard calls the hyper-real, to stay on this curve of popularity. Hyper-reality, of course, affects us across many different uh, spectrums. And uh, it's built on the real. It is not as though the hyper-real could get by without injections of reality in it. It, re it requires... And this is not a principle from Baudrillard, but one that I have realized from watching a lot of television. You have to have injections of reality in order to keep the images afloat occasionally. In fact, one of the new uh, strategies adopted by uh, television, and it, it, it serves two functions. One is a, is a cost function, uh, are these reality shows. They've realized that, that we've become, as it were, too intoxicated with hyper-reality with, you know, Kojak and, and, you know, super cops and so on. So now we just have shows like Cops, where you just go to Fort Worth and film a bunch of cops being cops. That serves a good, intelligent economic interest because you don't pay cops much just for being cops. It's not that lucrative. And it injects, well, is it reality? <laughs> well, it is compared only to this scale of hyper-reality and only under the sign of being whatever can be simulated. We have just had our first simulated trial. Not our first, but the first televised one that caused a riot. Rodney King, where the, the events are videotaped, the, the uh, trial is shown on television, the effects are all televised, and how anyone can find themselves around in these new phenomena and pr uh, pretend that nothing new has happened, that frustrates both Baudrillard and myself. I mean, he's not right about everything, but clearly something's different when we're in a world like that one, like this one. Clearly something significant has changed. And it has affected the very nature of what selves are, what humans are, what subjects are. When I talked about how my students had no dreams. I mean, what is there left to dream? When I was a kid, I dreamed about dinosaurs. I had a little Walt Disney dinosaur book. Why would I need to dream about dinosaurs now? Steven Spielberg has made them. He's filmed them. They're more real than real dinosaurs. They're hyper real. You would be disappointed if you saw a real Tyrannosaurus Rex after the movie you would be disappointed. It wouldn't be as noisy, as scary, or as frightening. 
Same is true of Jaws. He, you know, I've actually caught some rather large sharks. I mean, I like to, I like to fish, you know, pier fish. So I've caught a few sharks, some fa fairly good size. But those real experiences are so boring compared to Jaws. I mean, Jaws is a hyper-real experience. Now, now, the only way, I mean, there's no systematic way to discuss Baudrillard because these things are not systematic. These are the shifting, contingent ways in which cultures change and the people who draw their meanings from them change as the cultures change. So all we can do here is point to certain exemplary phenomena. So let me pick out some more. We've discussed hyperreality and uh, simulations. Let me uh, move on. Uh, Baudrillard wrote a wonderful piece about the Gulf War. The name of the piece was The Enemy Has Disappeared. And now, I don't want you to think that I believe what I'm about to say is my own position. I'm just giving you Baudrillard's. Uh, because I don't think the Gulf War was planned as deeply as he does in the regards that he thought it was. Uh, uh, Baudrillard uh, was offered a job by a French newspaper to cover the war. So, of course, he agreed on condition he not go to the Gulf because he wanted to cover it on CNN where it would really happen. Follow me? I mean, the war would really, who won or lost would be told to us on CNN. We won't know who won or lost anywhere else, so he, to cover the war in the, in the sense of hyper-reality, the way to cover it is sitting in one's flat in Paris on CNN. That's how he covered the war. His thesis runs as such. He took the Gulf War very seriously. Baudrillard states that war is real if anything is. I think that's a powerful quote. If anything is real, war is, you know? I mean, if, if, if we, it, it sounds pessimistic, but if there's something we could still attach reality and meaning to it, if it's not war, one would wonder what it was. Because it is a, 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 a just an incredible human event filled with passion, pain, suffering, madness, and all, of, and all that. If, if it's not real, what is? If anything at all would be, it would be war. According to Baudrillard's reading of the war, America, as for Baudrillard, the leading society culturally in the world, the one that leads the cultural trajectory of the world through television, movies, and so on, the war that we fought in the Gulf was not directed against the enemy. I mean, as it turned out, the enemy was left not much different than we found them. It was not directed against any enemy at all. They, the enemy disappeared in the show business. The war was directed against reality. The war was to show us that even war isn't real. The war was to kill the Vietnam Syndrome, a war that we remember as real, as a real war. So what, so the, the way to kill that memory, according to Baudrillard, is to fight a hyper-real war, complete with evening shots of shrapnel falling into Israel, which it turned out a lot of the shrapnel was from the patriots that were fired up into the sky. I mean, it, the scuds were, after all, uh, bad Russian technology, which isn't good technology, and the technology that we had sold them wasn't our best. It, it, it's sort of, uh, I mean, to the extent that there was some reality to the war, it was no more complex than the reason uh, that the British won a battle in the 12th century because their, their bow and arrows would shoot further than the other guys so they could stand further back. Sort of, the real part of the war may have been along those dimensions. <clears throat> but the hyper-real part was to watch the, the nightly scud watch, the scud explosions on TV. And it's hard to even evoke that, the feeling of togetherness the American people had in the glow of the television set, watching, and I mean, even the names are straight out of Steven Spielberg, Patriot missiles blowing up scuds. I mean, the, the poetry of the hyper-real is something, I mean, Walt Disney wouldn't do something that, that hokey. Patriots versus Scuds. I mean, that's worse than Darth Vader or something. I mean, so the Patriots would blow up the Scuds. Of course, later we found out, according to the Israeli military, that there were only, what, one or two confirmed hits. 
CNN, of course, showed those over and over and over again to us so that as we watched the war, since those hits could be simulated, the hyper-real feeling of continuing victory and success of our technology was, con was reinforced daily, capped off by the uh, moral equivalent of a sportscaster's comment at the end of a game every night when the military people would get out and roll out the scorecard for the day. Very much like we do after the Bulls and Phoenix play and we come out and, and sort of like the U.S. is Michael Jordan, you know, and the other side is Barkley and Michael, Michael scored 55, uh, Patriot missile shots and the other side 28 and we won, you know, against the third best team in, in the world, the third largest army. Well, by the end of the article, I, had, I was wondering, I was going, you know, that's just way too cynical even for me. I, I can't buy that argument. And then I began to think about what the war looked like on TV and a comment then, I, I, then I just had to start trying to find people who had been in the war. And sure enough, I found someone in Durham who had been, a, you know, a lot of North Carolina people go to the war. I found a young pilot and he said, oh, uh, that no, it, it, was, it was very exciting. And then he went on to explain to me how the sites that they used in order to, you know, fire their smart bombs were just like the games in the arcade that he grew up with. Said, said you know, uh, no way in the world could he have had better practice than he got within those arcades to fire his smart bombs. And, I mean, it had passed him by that the real had happened, even though he was really there. I talked to a woman who had been on the ground in a jeep for most of it. And she went, oh, the desert's so big and the sand. She said, but I really didn't get a feel for it till I got home and saw what my husband had taped. Why? Because the little individual actors sink into insignificance compared to the damn spectacle of the thing. The spectacle of it. I mean, when humans were less important than God, we could understand because he built everything. When we're less important than a Nintendo, we get confused. That's when we start thinking we're under siege. It's when Billy says, oh yes, you can kill mom and dad, but leave the Nintendo. Then we're, up, then we're rightfully upset. The postmodern trajectory leaves us in a situation where drawing the line between the real and the unreal is no longer merely philosophical, but a practical day-to-day -day issue. See, this is what I want to drive home. We're not off in some fairyland. This is a practical day-to-day -day issue of figuring out what's a simulation and what's not. Is this guy really an insurance salesman or is he here to rob me? You know, I mean, these, the, the, this, is, this is no longer Cartesian doubt that one has to conjure up in a meditation. This is a wide, radical doubt about the very ground beneath our feet. Whether, and it's the, whether the nature of whether it's real or not. Baudrillard says it's best at this point to simply face it that what we are witnessing is the end of the world, the end of human beings, and he thinks that there's no reason to be sad or upset or cynical about it. In fact, Baudrillard calls it the ecstasy of communication. I, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to do this in a kind of ironic way. I don't know how one presents this kind of material. I suggest you read books by this person. I, I brought one called Fatal Strategies about things one might do under such conditions. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, no, he, he thinks that just, uh, th th that th rather than this being occasion for some deep gloom, the ecstasy of, of uh, communication means that we should go ahead and realize that America has won the Cold War. America is utopia realized. This is the country everyone dreamed of. It is, of course, with all that we know that goes along with it now, it turns out to be, like all utopias, sadly disappointing. But weren't they always? Weren't they always? Every utopia, in some sense, boring and sadly disappointing? Well. Baudrillard says, says, no, we have to, in spite of this, we have to, to look upon uh, the end of man, the
the world, and so on, as an opportunity. Because what were these concepts anyway? Like, the man, like man and world, except concepts by which the world was regulated, policed, mapped, and controlled. All four of which are becoming more and more difficult to do under this situation of rapidly increasing complexity, which I've mentioned many times, and I mean system complexity at every level. Rapid increase in information technologies and invasions directly into the human body that interface it with machines. That goes all the way from plastic surgery to artificial hearts and implants to virtual reality where we'll be able to make a person who can't walk feel as though he can walk or she can walk. I mean, this is not a technology I dreamed up. They're trying now to develop cheap, marketable versions of this, as I speak here t right now. So, so Baudrillard doesn't want us to go, oh, it's the end of the world, it's the apocalypse. No, it's too late for that. It's already happened. If you wanted to moan, it, it was sort of like the moaning curve is past now, and it's time to try to, to sort of readjust to the flows in some way. And Baudrillard suggests a whole series of what he calls uh, fatal strategies by which we might be able to protect what he calls our fractal selves. If you know what fractals look like in geometry, little reproduced pictures out like this is one way to think of it. Our fractal, our fractal selves split, reproducible. Uh, we have life changes now, uh, and they've become not changes in our life. For example, to give you to show you the distance that we've traveled. Not like Augustine's conversion to Christianity when he hears, he, or, or thinks he hears the voice of God saying, tole, lege, take, read, and he reads the scripture and becomes a Christian. And then he, he's a new man. He's born again. No, 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 that's, that's over now. Now we change, all right. We change rapidly. We change, as I said, professions six or seven or eight times. And we change who and what we are the way we used to change our clothes and our fashion. I mean, th there are kids now who get through college and there are six different people before their junior year. Two months as a bohemian. Two months as a pre-med student. Two months as a preppy. Two months as a poet. A month and a half as a journalist. A month and a half as an ecologist. A month and all the, re and all the requisite uniforms for it. None of it felt. None of it part of affect. A fad, a personality formed as a fad, as a fashion, as an ornament. I mean, I, I, this, this really doesn't overstate the case for me. Well, one of the sensations this produces is not the sensations of existentialism, like dread, despair, and those. But it, it produces new sensations. Ecstasy is one of them. I mean, you go to see Jurassic Park or an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie for the ecstasy of communication. By that I mean for the pure neural thrill. Wow, a T-Rex, oh, a raptor. And it just runs through you, raptors, T-Rexes, or Arnold just beats up people that you, know, you view as bad or coded as bad by the society. And there's this visceral, ecstatic feel like when you get your first fax. I mean, this is, in the old days, your first fax, if you per, will permit me a slight vulgarity, was when you lost your virginity. Now, it still is, except now we mean faxing, you know, coming out like this, and it's, people tell little secret stories about it. When did you first fax? That's a different world, you know? If you're a fax virgin, you won't be, you won't understand it. You haven't lived. Yeah, that's a common story. Faxing has replaced a lot of things. Just fax it to me. No, anyway, uh, so, so ecstasy is one emotion that's produced by it. But don't think that it's the ecstasy of the sublime that, that Schiller talked about when one sees either a beautiful uh, landscape or of uh, uh, the, the other feeling of the sublime that one might associate with, with uh, standing before the Pieta or the David or something like that. It's not that kind of ecstasy. 
it's more visceral, it's more direct. It's more like the ecstasy that your children feel when they beat, you know, the worst monster at the highest level of the Link 2, you know, one of those new video games. And they beat the big monster, and there's just a visceral, neural thrill of ecstasy. What this may cause in some of the older generation like myself, I'm admitted, I've already admitted that I'm a still modern. I'm just trying to trace out the postmodern trajectory and look at it. I mean, my, my kids will have to live in more of it than I will ever see, so I'm trying to understand it and think about it as much as I can. And a sense you get is one that resembles vertigo. How many of you have seen Vertigo, the great Alfred Hitchcock movie? You know, that sort of sickly sense that you're twisting above a, sort of abysmally too much of something. This seems to me a fine sort of mood characterization for the postmodern trajectory a sense of vertigo before all this information. Well, if theses like the ones that I have just described that Baudrillard holds are true, but of course the word true will no longer apply because we'll be in a setting in which you won't want the true, you'll want the truer than true. You, you won't even, the false won't even be a good enough lie for you. You'll want the lie better than a lie. I mean, the truer than true explanation. You won't just want Oliver Stone's film about JFK. You'll want the film about how Oliver Stone himself participated in the plot to cover up the real assassins by making the film JFK. So you want the truth about the truth about the truth and all the way down, interminably. Vertigo, that's the sense you get looking down that chain of bizarre stories. And I think that, that there are, the way people deal with this is interesting. They deal with it as a form of complexity, a word I've used probably too many times. It makes them people caught in this cusp between an old world and an old paradigm that is dying and a new one that it cannot really yet be born. And we find ourselves in that space. And it draws us to people like Ross Perot who say, it's just that simple. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. That's the most powerful political rhetoric in a world with a postmodern trajectory. God, how we would love it if someone could tell us anything was just that simple. And then, of course, when you see a pie chart, you know, oh, a pie chart. I mean, it has more religious meaning now than a crucifix to see a pie chart. I mean, if, because why is, is that so popular? Because it reduces complexity. The complexity is very real, but his little sound bites, his little conversations with Larry King help to reduce that complexity, and they put another message in there. Now, I know it's real complicated, but we can fix it. Americans have always fixed it, and we can fix it. Well, if Baudrillard's right, we've fixed it all right. We've fixed it all the way up and down. And, 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 I mean, you know, we see other people engaging in this same, sort of try, attempting to reduce complexity. I mean, the political parties, to the extent that they exist at all anymore as anything other than fundraising devices, which I don't know, I don't think they have any ideologies, because in a postmodern situation, who would have an ideology except just as a momentary thing? Like, you're weak as a communist by Susie... St. Pierre at Duke. My week is a Trotskyist. My week is a Buddhist. My two weeks is a follower of the cult of Elvis. I mean, these are papers that you could legitimately expect people to write if they still read or wrote. Not many people still do either read or write much. But in, in any case, <coughs> reduction of complexity. Let's look at the political parties for a moment. The Republicans, with their great traditions, have come up with the slogan of incredible sophistication. No more tax and spend. Now, any of you who can quack that one out could be a Republican. And I'm using that in the Orwellian sense of quack. You don't need to engage higher brain functions. All you have to do is say, don't take my money. And don't spend it. Well, except on me and my friends but don't tax and spend. 
Now, it's not the Democrats are doing any better. I don't guess that's news. I mean, Clinton is now less popular than Castro. If Castro ran against Clinton, Clinton would lose by a few points. I mean, he wouldn't lose big, but he'd lose, you know, by a few points. I mean, especially in a three-person race with Clinton, Castro, Perot, and Gaddafi. I mean, I don't know who would win. In fact, in a, given this postmodern world, any one of the four could emerge with the biggest one-fourth, depending on how they ran the campaign. Probably it would depend on who could hire David Gergen. <laughs> you know, I mean, if Fidel got to Gergen first, he might win the damn thing. We don't know. But the Democrats' response to this tax and spend is, no, we don't. Nah, 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 nah. Invest. This is political debate in a democracy. No, it's not. It's the simulation of politics. Ross Perot is not leading a movement. It is a simulation of a movement. You follow me? This is not a populist revolt. Ross Perot is not Teddy Roosevelt. This is a simulation. Now, am I putting it down? No. In some ways, Ross Perot is a paradigmatically more real than real. He is hyper-real. I mean, as opposed to Reagan, uh, he really was a businessman that made millions. You know, I mean, a whole bunch of billions, I think, is fair in Ross's case. And uh, so on. I mean, so in a way, there is more reality to it. In any case, the, the, the current political structures are way behind this curve. They don't understand it well at all, in spite of all the talk about the selling of the president. That's very old-fashioned. We all have lived with advertising for years. What we haven't lived with are ads that have more narrative structure and meaning than the programs. And I'll mention a few of those, because I think they're interesting. The current McDonald's ads that kind of tell a part of your life story in like a two and a half minute ad, it's like from when you get married till you have your grandkids till you die and you get that two and a half minutes and then there's a McDonald's thing like, good, I was born, I had kids, I died, in the meantime I got a Big Mac. I mean this is sort of gone with the wind condensed into a short version. Uh, it's, it's fast, it's hyper real and in the meantime you at least got a Big Mac and you, you, know, you never will have to be hungry again, you know reproduced to infinity over and over on videotape, changed to laser disc. You can watch Scarlett O'Hara say that a million times. I, if we had the technology right now to do it, we could just have Scarlett back there screaming about terror while I'm doing this. In any case, uh, uh, the, if Baudrillard is even onto something, what the postmodern trajectory means is that the self is not under siege, it's lost. It's just lost. And if that's true, then all of the strategies by which ordinary people tried to live decent, good lives are lost along with it. I'm not necessarily going to buy that right away. I'm really not. I do think that, that the, uh, the new... Uh, the new technologies are going to call forth. I mean, this is why the title of this course has been The Self Under Siege. If I didn't think it was a real, virulent, technological siege and just some thought-up philosopher's dream, this would not have interested me. I mean, I have no interest in that. I mean, what I am interested in is what it's changing the lives of my children and your children and so on. What will shape culture society, and what we used to call society, culture and history, that's what I am interested in. If it is the end of the world, I want to know so my kids and I can enjoy the apocalypse together. If America is utopia realized, then I maybe I'll just settle back and go to Epcot Center and forget Switzerland. Just go on the Swiss ride. This may be what I'll do. I doubt it. I don't like it. The war zone, in other words, may not be, in, in defending the self, may not be any one of the classical ones like the working class versus the ruling class, the slaves against the masters, oppressed women against uh, a, a patriarchal society, blacks against whites. No, the struggle in the future may be to maintain the real against the unreal or the hyper-real or the irreal. 
the desire for experience, and this is, I'm, I'm trying to kind of be upbeat about the situation that we're in. The desire for experience is also the experience for, a, a, is also a desire for a kind of experience. What I mean by that is this, that even in these rather, you know, the rather hopeless picture I, I painted of the young, there remains something like a curiosity about what experience would be like if I could have one. And there is an absolute extremism everywhere about how far people will go to try to have a genuine experience. If I can still use the word genuine, you see, because again, the language has been polluted by this very movement that I've been describing. If say genuine, you'll think about a genuine beer or genuine boots or a genuine, you know, cowboy hat or whatever. No, a genuine experience, an authentic experience, a real experience. The battle lines may be between anonymous forces of, that have been unleashed by a technology that grew out of capital that will be controlled in the hands of not many people, perhaps, perhaps not, I mean, we don't know, and people who still would like to have some experience. This wouldn't make them archaic old fuddy-duddies if they said, hey, look, honey, why not tonight? Why don't we really make love, the two of us, instead of getting in our virtual reality sex machines. That may become a revolutionary move in the, in the near future. It may be. It may become interesting if a candidate runs for an office and actually believes one thing. Well, that'd be, that'd be an, an incredible new politics. You know, everybody in America wants a new politics. We'll go out and find somebody that believes one damn thing and run him for something. You'll have a new politics. I mean, that's the, 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 ex, the deficit of experience that hasn't been sucked into this system of images and so on. Now, this sounds extreme, but think of how we're socialized, all of us, continually bombarded with images from magazines, TVs, newspapers, videotapes. I'm not unaware of where I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the circuit, too, now. Uh, if you want to, st by the way, the, for a moment, follow Baudrillard's advice. He wrote a very cute book called Forget Baudrillard, which meant you, you, this stuff is not theoretical. It's happening all around you, so forget Baudrillard. He also wrote a book called Forget Foucault, where he talks about how it's the spectacle of the prison more than the prison that frightens us now. In other words, it's rap music with its I'm going to kill you stuff that really scares you. You very seldom ever see a black person. We mostly stay away from them. So don't see many of them. So it's sort of like their music that scares us by, you know, giving us a projection of street life itself that, that parades as real, but actually it's more real than real. You know, I've been in Compton. They don't have a drive by every two minutes. It's just, that's not true. I mean, not that I could prove it because we have these images of hyper-reality. Well, this calls for fatal strategies, according to Baudrillard. We have to adopt fatal strategies here, fatal strategies, extremes. We have to learn to live with complexity, uncertainty, and a certain amount of vertigo. We just have to do that. We don't have any choice. I mean, we only have the dinosaur choice. That's which kind of wander off into the ice caps and sort of fall away. We, and, I, and I also think that, that we have to uh, be wary of the, of the over, over quick reduction of complexity. If some of this lecture has seemed a little weird or to go a little too far, it's because I don't want to reduce quite all of this to slogans. On the other hand, I don't want it to not be funny because part of the postmodern trajectory itself is a rather humorous joke on the human race, which labored for millennia to reduce working hours in order to produce leisure so we could enjoy this very leisure that then turns in a kind of vengeful act against us, absorbing our leisure time, which was to be our living time, into time now spent in the service of what can only be called this inhuman spectacle. I mean, it's a very bizarre and twisted fight in which, to which postmodernity has led us. So I would be wary of simple answers to this. One way to follow it without, to follow some of these developments without reading Baudrillard 
is to follow uh, cyberpunk artifacts. Movies like Blade Runner, and also places which you're likely to show up in anyway. Look at the latest malls and how the, the tracks are designed in them. You know, the little paths. I mean, you can't walk just anywhere in a mall now, can you? No, I mean, they're little pathways, tracks. Uh, look at the, at the, go to Atlanta and see a hotel that gleams like a glistening palace and all this. Well, before I get too carried away with all these phenomena, which you can see around you every day, you've got to remember that even in that hotel in Atlanta, in the winter, the poor still crawl in the postmodern cracks and sleep at night. So, I mean, it is not as though that turning the world, as it were, hyper real has somehow done anything other than make our situation more extreme vis-a-vis -vis those people who have fallen, as it were, out of the loop altogether. There is in this country now the most alarming lack of sympathy for those people who've fallen off the boat, if you know what I mean. People who've somehow slipped off the track. I mean, I'm not sure they want a lot of sympathy, but if they did, there'd be an alarming short supply of it. And I think part of that is because they add still further to the complexity. When I've talked about the postmodern in the way Baudrillard does is a trajectory, I see it as an emergent aspect of our culture. Our culture is still dominantly modernist, rationalized, capitalist, and so on. And to even make things more complex, thirdly, there are residual elements in our culture left over from earlier periods. For example, patriarchy, left over from a past as ancient, perhaps, as the species. Well, I don't know how much further we can go down this road, but in any case, uh, the road, according to Baudrillard, is an endless set of what will it be fatal strategies, to use his new title. Uh, and all we can do is wait and see what will happen. If nothing does, in the sense of the real, Baudrillard will have a kind of confirmation. It's my hope that he will be disconfirmed on the simple grounds that wherever we find power, even the power of the hyper-real, we, we find counter power. And where we see an image that reproduces us as inhuman, occasionally we see an image that somehow has the bizarre transcendent power to make us slightly more human again. But it's along that terrain, I think, that the battles and the struggles, the self will fight with itself will be fought in the future.